Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back. We are uh, taking a tour through the book of Hebrews, and we are in chapter 11. Uh, we're up and running, going through the Hall of Fame of Faith, and looking to see who the heroes of our faith actually are, and more importantly, what is the faith that animates them? What does it mean that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen? And what does it mean that each of the little episodes in this Hall of Fame of Faith begins with the phrase, by faith, and then describes a hero and what that hero did? What does it mean that all these things were done by faith, or that these episodes are um, uh, prepended with the label by faith? So I want to talk about that as we go into the next episode, but before we do, let's ask a blessing on our reading of the scriptures. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again uh, for what we recognize as a great privilege to be able to read on a page your very words. And I pray that the gospel that is contained within them of your unconditional love and favor towards all your people would sink down into our hearts as we read today and fill us up with joy and peace uh, and energy and love for our fellow man. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So quick review. Uh, last time I spoke, we talked about Cain and Abel, and we mentioned that by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. We talked about what that possibly could have meant. And then we, we also talked about the verse that says, Abel, though he is dead, still speaks to us. And I mentioned that Abel actually is one of the mouthiest guys in all of the Bible for someone who died young. Three different times in the scriptures, his blood is mentioned as having a voice and saying something specific right to the ear of God. And even here in Hebrews, we, we see that Abel, though, is dead, though he died, still speaks. Back in the original passage, we find that God is walking around and the voice of Abel cries out to him from the ground. And then later on in Hebrews, we find that the blood of Jesus is mentioned as speaking a better word than the word of the blood of Abel. Uh, by which we mean we understand that it's a similar word, but better. And so we talked last time, what does it mean? What is the blood of Abel on about? What does it say? And I suggested that the thing the blood of Abel says that made his sacrifice a better one than the sacrifice of Cain is, Oh God, I'm dead. Help me. That's what the blood of Abel says. Help! I'm dead. That's the only thing the blood of a dead man can say to God, right? But that's also, we found out, the thing, the reason that his sacrifice was better than the sacrifice of Cain. Because it was the sacrifice of a man saying, help me, I'm dead. And also, it was a blood sacrifice itself. It was a symbol of the deadness that the sacrifice always has to take when it goes into the presence of God. And we reiterated this idea that we got from earlier in the book, that anything, in order to stand in the presence of God, you have to be consecrated to God, which in the Old Testament sacrificial sense means you have to have your throat cut. You have to be dead. This is how Jesus makes it into the Holy of Holies. He is crucified. It's how we draw near to God by riding Jesus' death into the Holy of Holies, by experiencing and living out the death of Christ so that he can raise us up, so he can answer Abel's question or answer Abel's plea. Help me, I'm dead. And he answers that plea with, resurrection right so this is what we got from the first episode by faith abel offered a better sacrifice than cain and god was pleased so what does by faith mean by saying help me i'm dead abel offered a better sacrifice than that of cain so let's take that idea into the second episode of the hall of fame of faith and it starts in hebrews 11 verse 5 by faith enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found, because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and that he rewards those who seek him. A familiar passage, probably, at least the last part, right? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
For anyone who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. But what of Enoch, anyway? Why is Enoch listed as a Hall of Famer in faith? Let's go back to the original passage. This is a reference to Genesis 5.22. And here's the entire testimony of the scriptures with respect to Enoch. Most of you aren't going to get mentioned in the scriptures at all. Enoch is not mentioned much. But it does say this about him. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And then in verse 24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. There it is. That's the, that's the story of Enoch that the New Testament writers are using. So twice it says Enoch walked with God. And then the second, after the second one it says, and God took him. And no one saw him again. He was not, it says. So Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. The New Testament writer, Hebrews guy, we're calling him, expands on that just a little bit and gives us some conclusions to draw. And this is what I want to talk about today. First of all, we hear that Enoch's getting taken up into heaven was something about faith. By faith, he was taken up into heaven. Let's parse the English. What does that mean? By faith, Enoch was taken up into heaven so that he should not see death and he was not found because God has taken him. What does it mean that he went up to heaven by faith? What is, what is your... What is your training in Christianity? What is your experience with the scriptures? What is your experience with the Lord and your knowledge of how he works tell you that it means that Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death by faith? Does it mean he really didn't happen? He just believed that it happened? Because he has the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen? Hey, Enoch, how you doing? I'm not here. God has taken me. I have faith, you see. Probably not. Isn't it probably more like God saw his faith and rewarded it with a, an early trip to heaven? I mean, isn't that the sense of the passage in verse six? Uh, sorry, in verse five? Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. The Septuagint translation of the Old Testament translates Enoch walked with God as Enoch pleased God. Okay, the Greek trans, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament is translated, Enoch, uh, Enoch pleased God, and he was not, for God took him. In fact, the New Testament writer says that may be it, because he, say, he uses it too. Hebrews guy says, now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So what does it mean by faith? Does it mean something like Enoch's faith produced a lifestyle that the rest of the, the other translations say looks like he walked with God. Enoch's faith resulted in a walk, a Christian walk, that we would say in the 20th century, that was so laudable that God commended him for it and said, I'm not going to make you die. You get to skip death because of your walking with God. Because of the results and the product of your faith. Is that, the, is that what it means by faith? Is that what by faith means in this passage? Maybe so, because in verse 6, the Hebrews God goes on to say, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God has to have faith. has to believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Faith produces diligent seeking of God, produces walking with God, produces pleasing God, and produces this awesome result. You get to skip death, Enoch. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. And I don't have, I'm not an expert on these things at all, but it rubs me the wrong way to put that version of the Enoch story right after that version of the Abel story. I think the two stories are of a piece a little bit more than that. And I want to point out a misreading of verse 6 that I have always cherished and have just only recently examined in myself, and see if you guys see a misreading in there too. I add words to verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11, where it says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. 
before we go to for whoever would draw near to God, I add a little, a little something. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Meaning that no matter what you do, if you don't do it by faith, it is displeasing to God. But if you have faith, then it is possible to please him. Meaning what you do after you have faith is pleasing to God. That faith is, a, is an attitude with which you do something. Faith is an attitude. It's a mindset. It's a, it's a predisposition towards God that informs the way you do stuff. And if you don't have faith, then you always do stuff in a displeasing way or you do things that displease God. And, but if you do have faith, you have the power somehow to do things that please him or to do things in a better way that's pleasing. And your faith is therefore an engine for pleasing God. It's a, it's a, it's a power that allows you to then please God by the works of your hands or the actions of your body or in the Enoch phrase, the steps of your walk. Except I don't think that's the only way to read that passage, especially since two-thirds of it I just injected myself. Two-thirds of it came out of my head and my heart and my history with Christianity and with the Lord. What it actually says is, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Another way of saying that might be, and again, not an expert, but let's think about it, only faith pleases God. Only faith pleases God. I want to suggest to you that Enoch was pleasing to God because he said, in effect, the same thing Abel said. Help, I'm dead. Please resurrect me. Now, it's a slightly different thing that, that Enoch said than Abel because the circumstances were a little bit different. Abel was killed. So he actually literally physically said, help, I'm dead. But Enoch might have said something similar. Help, I'm afraid of death. Right? Maybe that's what Enoch said. Help, I'm afraid of death. Again, total interpolation here. Enoch, walking along, walking with God, saying, help God, I'm afraid of death. I realize that death is coming for me. And I realize there's not a thing I can do about it. And maybe not just theologically, philosophically speaking, but I realize that my life is full of death. And I am powerless to fix it and to change it. Death is all around me. The death of my loved ones, the death of my dreams, the death of my freedom, the death of my, uh, my independence the death of my ability to call out my own future and make it happen. Help, Lord, I'm dying, and I don't want to die. If the Enoch passage is going to be taken in the same vein as the Abel passage, that's a decent reading, right? Enoch said to God something along the lines of what Abel said, and it was faith in Enoch's case, just like it was faith in Abel's case. I am dead or I'm afraid of death. Save me from death. Save me from the fear of death. And what did God say in Enoch's case? In Enoch's dramatic, symbolic case, he said, okay, you are free. I deliver you from death. You get to skip it. I bring you to the end to re I resolve all of your fear of death by defeating death in your case. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Now, how did Enoch get to that wonderful conclusion? How did Enoch get to that wonderful payday? How did he earn that kudo and that accolade from God? Well, if verse 6 is to be believed in the reading that I'm suggesting, he did one thing and one thing only. He cried out to God in faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the reading that I'm putting that on, again, is only faith ever pleases God. Only faith pleases God. Because anyone who, must draw, who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, 
I want to talk about this last verse for just a minute, and then hopefully we can have a fun discussion because I'm out over my skis and I realize it. <laughs> I realize it. But I want to uh, talk about the first half of that verse separately from the second half. Um, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. How big a, how big a bar is this as an obligation on God's people? How easy is it to believe that God exists? You ever think about that for a minute? How tall an order is that to believe that God exists? I want to suggest this answer to you. It depends on whether God has put faith in his existence in your heart or not. And if he has, it's the easiest thing in the world because you can't get away from it. And if he hasn't, it's not your day. <laughs> and it's impossible. Right? Faith in God is impossible or it's a complete and utter given. Right? Those of us who are believers, who are as angry with God as a person can be, right now, who believe that God is against them and have evidence for their case, don't have a problem with faith at all. They know exactly whose face to shake their fist in. Right? I've often said, I said it to my kids when they're going through difficult times, look, being angry is not, that's not a sin. Faith is shaking your fist in the right face. God, you did this to me. And God, who is patient enough to disregard the tone of voice, says, yes, I know. Let's talk about that. That's no less faithful than, oh, God, thank you for all the blessings that you poured down upon my life. Just different set of circumstances, right? The believer believes. It ain't no trouble. The unbeliever can't. So here's, let's go back to verse 6. Uh, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he is. So how wide open is your path to the presence of God, you believer? How close to God are you standing right now in your shaking of your fist in his face because he is doing you dirt right this minute and there's evidence to prove it? How closely are you walking with God? in the midst of that anger at him. I want to suggest that Enoch, in this reading, is any indication. You can't get any closer. Enoch walked with God, which could mean Enoch shook his fist in the right face every time circumstances came and confounded him. It could mean that Enoch cried out in fear of death to the right ear. Enoch said, I am afraid of death. I do not want to experience death in my life. I do not want to die. And the right ear heard his cry. Because in that screaming out in anguish, he was walking with God. He was a man of faith. He pleased God because he believed that God existed. Can it, can it be possible that saying, God, you did this to me, how dare you, is pleasing to God? Well, if it's a cry of faith, it is. If Hebrews 11.6 is to be believed. How irritated does God get when we yell at him and say, you did this to me, how dare you? How irritated how angry well since Jesus died on the cross not very not very it is as faithful to shake your fist in that face it is as much an example of walking with God as the other thing God is pleased when we believe that he exists in fact I would say anything else on any other basis it is impossible to please him. Think about that for a minute. Separate, absent, separate from our theological belief in his existence. Can we please him by an act of charity? Can we please, please him by flying halfway across the world to preach the gospel to missionary children? No. No, we can't. 
We can't because everything that's wrong with that, every element of our own self that's in that, every irritation and pride, every little thing queers the entire deal in the absence of that theological commitment to his existence and the emptiness of my hands in his presence and the fact that the only way I get into his presence is to ride the death of Christ into the Holy of Holies, to be dead. Without that, without that faith of God, you exist. You are the face to shake my fist in. We can't please him at all. It is the only thing. Enoch walked with God, meaning he had a really good relationship with God or a really violent one, depending on the circumstances. And God said, by the way, Abel's case was symbolic, right? The blood of Abel. Abel said theologically, he said, help, I'm dead. And God said, good, and I'm going to save you, but you're also a symbol for all time, so I'm also going to kill you. I'm going to have, I'm going to have Cain, your brother, slaughter you, so that your actual physical blood will help the slow readers in centuries to come get the point, <laughs> right? Same thing with Enoch, right? Enoch said, God, I'm afraid of death. And not just physical death, but I'm afraid of difficult circumstances. I'm afraid of the death of my relationships and the death of my children and the death of my dreams. God said, I deliver you from all your fears. Oh, and by the way, since the slow readers in millennia to come are going to have a hard time with the theology, I'm going to take you straight to heaven. You don't have to experience physical death either. And Enoch said, wow, it's great to be a symbol. <laughs> Enoch believed that God exists. Easy. There is a second half of verse 6, however, that takes some thinking about. Because it's not just necessary, it would appear, in order for us to please God, to draw near to God, to believe that God exists. We also have to believe one other thing. We also have to believe that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Right? And this, this passage could potentially throw a, uh, a chilly pall over the um, grace-filled reading that I'm trying to give to this verse. Because not only do you have to believe, not only is there a theological commitment necessary in order to please God, but there is also a belief or, or an assent to a particular economy that God checks to see whether his people are diligently seeking him and rewards that diligence with his presence. In other words, your faith, your, your, your um, status as one who pleases God has to have two components. You gotta believe that he exists and you gotta believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And that very well may be, again, I'm making this up, but I do wanna point out that the word that in the second half of verse 6 is in italics in your Bible. Does anybody know what that means? Does anybody know what a word in italics in your Bible means? It means that the word that, the word that's translated that, or the word that, is not in the original language. It's not in the original text of the Old Testament. The Old Testament and indeed the New Testament, because they're written in Hebrew and Greek respectively, are filled with words like that, that translators have to, have to insert in order for the thing to be readable in English. You can't just do a word for word translation of Hebrew and have it mean anything necessarily, because it's put together differently. Same thing with Greek. But if you leave out the words that are not in the original text in Hebrews 11.6, the last part of that verse says this. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, and he rewards those who seek him. You guys catch the difference there? Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. In other words, there's one thing necessary. And by the way, here's something about God you should keep in mind. He will be found by those who seek. It's not an obligation, in other words. It's not an extra thing we've got to do. It's not the insertion of an economy of payment for services rendered. It's an encouragement, a reminder that God is not trying to hide. 
It's a reminder that in the midst of our difficulty, when we would shake our fist in his face, he wants to be standing near to us. What is it that we're seeking in the last half of verse 6? He rewards those who seek him. What do we seek? What does verse 6 say that we're seeking? Those who would draw near to God must believe that he exists. And he rewards those who seek a place near to him. He rewards those who seek the comfort of his presence. He rewards those who seek relationship with him. He rewards those who shake their fist in his face because they really want to know that he is there. They want to know his presence. They want to be comforted by his sovereignty and his provision. This last half of chapter 6 does not say you must be a diligent seeker of God in order for God to be near to you. It says by being a believer, you are. He's, a, he's dependable. It's a sure thing. He rewards. Like rewards, like showers down the thing you're seeking in abundance. In the same way that he gave Enoch the ultimate gift for someone afraid of death. That you don't have to do it. So I want to encourage you today to think about the thing that is death in your life right now. The thing that you are afraid of. The worst thing in the world that has actually happened that you are walking through. And I want you to think about that thing instead of physical death itself, unless physical death is that thing for you. And I want you to imagine this interpretation of the story of Enoch as applying to you. And not to think of Enoch as some special guy who walked with God in some way that is unique in all the world. I want you to think of Enoch instead as a symbol of an everyday grocery store variety believer who had one distinguishing characteristic, which is that he believed that God exists. And I want you to see what happened to Enoch as God rewarding those who seek him. And I want you to remember that seeking God either means thanking him for the good things that he's brought along in your life or shaking your fist in his face. God rewards that kind of faith because that is faith. He rewards that. With what in Enoch's case? With what in Abel's case? Resurrection. Deliverance from death. By the way, I forgot to read you the last part of the literal translation of Hebrews 11.6. It's not that, um, and he rewards those who seek him. It's that he becomes a rewarder of those who seek him. Isn't that strange? The original language in the, in the Greek there has kind of, and I'm not going to do Greek syntax and, and grammar with you here, but it has a future tense kind of connotation. The Young's literal translation is where I got this. He becomes a rewarder of those who seek him. Isn't that great? God is setting it up so that you can correctly interpret your, your circumstances. Has he become a rewarder of you yet? Me either. <laughs> Not yet. I'm still in the midst of death. Still working it out. Still waiting to be resurrected. Hebrews guy says, I know. Me too. Me too. But this, the example of Enoch was given to us. The example of Abel was given to us so that we would be encouraged while we wait. How long did Enoch walk with God? By which I mean alternately praising and yelling at God before he took him up. 300 years. Have you ever wondered why the 300 years is in there? Maybe that's it. Long, blinking time. God probably, you know, I probably said a time or two, you know, it's been 245 years. And God said, I'm coming. I'm coming. Just remember, you've already qualified. Because we're talking. You know who to talk to. That is your one qualification. So if, if your cry is Abel today, help, I'm dead. If your cry is Enoch today, help, I'm afraid of death. 
If you cry as Noah's next week, help, we're all going to die. <laughs> just remember, just remember, the one qualification that is needful and that is necessary has been met in you by the gift of God in Jesus Christ. You believe that he exists. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that you would make us men and women of faith. And that's a better way to say it. Lord, thank you that you have made us men and women of faith by giving us that gift. I pray that you would help us to rest in it, that you would help us to rejoice in it. And Lord, I pray, as we're going to see in the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, that you would give us such energy and such freedom and such strength to do all the things you have planned for us to do in this world because of it. I just pray for, for your sovereignty over that whole process. In Jesus' name, amen.